And there's a green light. And here we are. Welcome back to the Stratosphere Lounge. Ladies and gentlemen, after a two-week absence, or nearly a three-week absence, I have to tell you, it's been, uh, <laughs> you have no idea how uh, how I prepare for this show, honestly. For some reason or another, I can't explain it. Something happens on Wednesday afternoon, starting around 4 o'clock, and I jump into this chair, and i doing 15 things at the same time, and I start the music, and the next thing you know, the show's on. So I've never once, I don't think, out of the 14 or 15 or however many we've done, ever had time to just calmly sit here and collect my thoughts. It's always somebody, it's like, you know, the uh, ejection seat, right? Which is uh, part of eject, eject, eject uh, mythology for so long. It's kind of like a reverse ejection seat. It's like all these parts and stuff floating around, and then just 10 seconds before the green light goes on, everything just goes. And here I am in the chair. Howdy, everybody. It's good to see you, and uh, it's good to be back, although I don't ever really completely go away, of course. Um, but needless to say, an eventful couple of weeks since we spoke last and some fun things to talk about, and uh, yours truly is feeling a little better than he did uh, two weeks ago at the Stratosphere Lounge because uh, two weeks ago I was becoming, con con well, not convinced, I was becoming concerned that the media was actually going to steal this election, that they really were going to find a way to be able to spin every little thing to so much of a degree that it wasn't 15 points anymore that Evan Thomas said it was in 2004 or the 20 or 25 points of media spin that, that that's 25 points at the polls that it was in 2008. I was beginning to think you cannot win elections against a, a 50 percentage point headwind. I just don't know if you can. Um, and... Uh, Anyway, feeling a little better about that. So, lots to talk about tonight, and um, not a whole lot of time. As I mentioned in the comments section, or for the uh, question section for tonight's show, I'm going to probably have to keep this down to about an hour, uh, because at uh, 7.15 Pacific, that's another hour and 10 minutes from now, uh, and i got to get some time to get over there, uh, Scott Rasmussen is going to be sitting down, and I've had a chance to talk to Scott privately at... Um, right online in Vegas a couple months ago, and he was confident then. Uh, I'm sure he's, his confidence had waned a lot with the traction that the Obama ads were getting and the fact that Mitt Romney, uh, in my opinion, was 100 percent absolutely correct to say what he said in Cairo. And of course, the mainstream media turned that into, um, you know, turned a, a debacle on the part of the State Department into um, you know, Romney gate. And I watched that whole thing happen and I thought, bam, how, how are we going to get around this? How are we going to get around this? I just don't know. Find a color that makes my skin tone look better. I'm hoping it's the purple. There we can try that. Uh, anyway, uh, so let's get started. We got a lot to talk about tonight. And again, it's good to be back. Uh, start with our first question, which again, I select out of the comments at uh, Facebook. And I know uh, many of you submit comments and they don't get asked. And I suppose just statistically, there must be some of you out there who've submitted four, five, six, ten comments and still haven't been picked yet, and for that I deeply apologize. Uh, but anyway, uh, I just take the ones that I think are interesting, and, and I think they're pretty much all interesting, but I try to find things that I haven't talked about, or at least I'm in a mood to talk about. So let's start with Elise Faith Bingham, who writes, Do you think the liberals will be successful in claiming they never said a film was responsible for the death of an American ambassador? Uh, for those of you who have not been paying attention, uh, when the attack happened in Benghazi a month ago, it's been a month, can you believe that? Uh, they claimed that, uh, the Obama administration claimed that this was the result of uh, of just, you could hear it in their tone. What, they didn't actually say it, but what they were implying was justifiable outrage because uh, an American filmmaker had made a movie that was disrespectful to Islam, and so therefore, once again, the world is going to burn down. Uh, and I wanted to talk about this a lot tonight because I haven't had a chance to talk about it in I did talk about it recently, but I still haven't calmed down over this. I had said, I think, before on this show that when Obama was on TV and sold out the missile defense shield to the Russians, sold out Poland too, a country that's used to being sold out and a country that showed a lot of courage and took a big risk, stupidly, as it turns out, by uh, throwing their lot in with the United States of America, that that was as angry as I've been and I simply couldn't imagine anything more outrageous or more um, disgusting coming out of Barack Obama and, and his administration. But then we saw these attacks in Benghazi, and while the buildings were still on fire, we heard that this was a result of a first American, uh, of an American down in Florida 
I'm sorry, here in California, I think it was, uh, making a movie that made uh, the profit look bad, and therefore the people were rioting in the streets. The Cairo embassy, uh, which is an arm of the State Department, issued a statement saying that, you know, we, we uh, basically condemn this horrible movie. And, and then, you know, it just, it just gets, it, it gets more, I'm really going to get too lathered up here. I said before, and I'll say it again, uh, Jeremy Boring actually put this into words that I thought were beautiful in terms of how they encapsulated how I feel about these things. I think that as president of the United States, it is the duty of the American president to spend the life of every single every single person in the military if that's what it takes in order to defend our rights and our freedoms. I said that's why people sign up for the military. They don't sign up for Barack Obama or George Bush. They sign up for freedom. And freedom is the Bill of Rights. And first freedom among those is not just the right to free speech, because that makes it sound like it's a political thing, like it's your right to stand on a soapbox someplace and talk about politics, which it certainly is. But the fundamental issue at stake with this whole business of blaming this on a movie was that it is the fundamental American freedom to speak your mind without fear of the consequences. It's the only reason I can do a show like this. The only reason why you can put your name on Facebook comments uh, for a show like this is because you still have attached to your uh, consciousness the idea that in America and as an American you can talk about what you want to and not have to pay a political price for it. You don't have to worry about going to jail or 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 sitting in a dungeon or uh, being executed or or just having IRS uh, audits. These kind of things. This is the fundamental freedom. This is the primary freedom, and it used to, it should be the worth of worth the life of every single person in the military to defend those rights, and then it should be the right of every citizen, worth the life of every citizen lined up behind those people to keep refilling those ranks. I know that sounds bombastic and and uh, and over the top, but I don't think it's over the top. I think it's it's what I believe. I think it's worth the lives of everybody who, who signs up, and it's certainly been worth the lives of everybody who's given their lives for this country in the past. So for the Obama administration and the State Department to basically come out and say, hey, tell you what, we'll trade you this First Amendment right in exchange for you not being so nasty, especially before an election cycle, that easily trumped uh, the giving up of our national security, just, uh, just our defenses. That's just what Benedict Arnold did. Um, giving up our fundamental freedoms in exchange for this man's re-election in order to spin this thing is the most shocking thing I've ever seen in my life, in, in a lifetime that continues to be shocked and amazed and appalled. And I thought there's simply no way that can be Trump, but it turned out it, there was something on, on this whole thing that trumped that. It, it trumped even that. Something that trumped even the President of the United States basically saying that the future does not belong to the insulters of Islam. Says who? Says who it doesn't? It's belonged to the insulters of Islam for the for the last 250 years that this country's been been in existence. The, the country's first military action was to insult Islam and go down there and whoop the Barbary pirates. It's this is the entire idea of America. So we can insult anybody we want to. God knows it, it, that Barack Obama wouldn't have any problems saying that there's a that the future doesn't belong to the um, insulters of Jesus Christ because those people get paid by the federal government to insult Jesus Christ through the National Endowments of the Arts. So for the president to say the future does not belong to the insulters of Islam, we, we know, we know where this man falls on this battle between Islamic fundamentalism and freedom and the rights of America. It's crystal clear, he says it every couple of months, some chance he gets to come out and state, I'll apologize for America here in Cairo. I'll, I'll bow to a Saudi ambassador or, or a Saudi king. I'll, we know it's not up for discussion anymore. It's certainly not. The president of the United States of America is not on the side of America in the war that America finds itself in today, period. Everybody knows it. And I'm going to come back to this later, but honest to God, if you are a Republican or a patriot of any kind, or you know Republicans or patriots of any kind who are determined to sit this election out because you don't like Mitt Romney's position on health care, you might want to think about this. You might want to think about the fact that the president of the United States, sitting president of the United States, who has said on camera that if he can just get past his next election, he can be a lot more flexible with people like the Russians and these Islamic 7th century fundamental fanatic savages. It's going to get a lot worse. 
I cannot, I cannot understand how a person who loves America says I'm going to sit this one out because I don't like Mitt Romney's position on health care. The president of the United States has committed treason openly and t two occasions now will sell out our defenses to the Russians and will sell out our First Amendment to these, to these Islamic savages. And people still have a hard time deciding on this. Ann Althaus has been posting on Instapunnet, which I personally think is a bad idea that anybody else is po posting on Instapunnet. I like Glenn Reynolds posting on, on Instapunnet. And she said, after all of this stuff in Wisconsin and after su supposedly being a voice of reason on all of these ideas, she said that pointing out Barack Obama's uh, racial inconsistencies is ugly, makes us ugly, and that she's genuinely undecided at this point in the race. And I flew over to uh, Ann Althaus House and, uh, a blog and, and left a comment basically saying, if you're still undecided at this point, Ann, you might want to really seriously, seriously take a look at some of your articles over the last three or four years, because you're either lying to us then or you're lying to yourselves now. Honest to God, I cannot, I cannot fathom this. But as I said, I thought there'd be nothing that could trump the United States president saying uh, things like the future does not belong to the insulters of Islam, or uh, we'll, we need to suppress our First Amendment because uh, we don't want to make these, these rabid, frothing radicals angry at us. Um, let's not forget what else he said. Uh, what was that? Uh, the future, uh, he said something besides the insult, the, the future does not, oh, I remember. He basically got to the uh, United Nations and basically said, if you listen to him, uh, what, what he said was, um, you know, what with cell phones and everything and the ability to post on Facebook and YouTube, you know, right from the street, it's virtually impossible for me to suppress the First Amendment the way I could have back in the day. I mean, you really listen to him. He's apologizing for the fact that it's so difficult now to control what Americans say. Sorry, uh, you know, other countries of the world. It, it, it's just really hard for me to keep a lid on this free speech thing when everybody has an iPhone. That's basically what he said. So anyway, uh, no, there's no way to top all this. Well, it turns out there is. Turns out there is a way to actually top this. And this is a trivial thing compared to the magnitude of this treasonous, unbelievable sellout of our values and our security. But there is something he did that actually trumped my disgust for him by making these statements. And that was simply this. It became reliably known not too much longer after the attacks that the president of the United States on the night of the attack heard reliable information from his intelligence sources saying that a U.S. embassy was under attack with rocket-propelled grenades and AK-47s, and he went to bed. I'm going to have to just sit here for a second and have another sip of water, because if I start speaking now, I'm really concerned about what's going to come out of my mouth. Who does that? Who 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 can do that? Who who of you who of you out there watching the show now can put yourself in a situation like that? Forget about being president of the United States. Let's say you have a gas station that you own, or you own a restaurant, or something like that. We have a restaurant, a friend of ours, uh, a restaurant that we frequent here, and it's just a little hole in the wall. And he wouldn't be ashamed. The owner of that restaurant, who I've gotten to be friends with, wouldn't be ashamed to to hear me describe it as that. It's just in a strip mall. And um, he's, in a, he's an immigrant, a legal immigrant to America, and he's playful and fun, and he says, we don't serve your kind in here, and we say, well, we'd better call the ambulance so it'll be here in time for when the food poisoning hits, and this is the kind of relationship we have with this guy, and we bend over laughing. We, we just have such a great time. And this guy got a call at 2 o'clock in the morning not too long ago because a Russian and two people in his car uh, had been drinking so heavily, which is, seems to be a pattern with Russians, uh, that this restaurant that our friend has called Reno's here in Studio City, California, and his restaurant is in a strip mall and it's at a T intersection where a road runs into Ventura Boulevard. And apparently a Russian guy had been partying enough and was so driving, so falling down blind drunk that he took this corner on this T intersection. It must have been 80, 90 miles an hour. It's a right angle turn. It's no ramp, it's no curb. It's a right angle turn with a stoplight. He went around that corner at some insane speed, hit the curb, jumped up high enough to go through the window of this restaurant. This window's gotta be four or five feet off the ground. Severed a gas main as he did it. Uh, the gas main caught fire and the three people in the car burned to death inside this guy's restaurant, right there at his back table. 
And needless to say, as the owner of the restaurant, he went down to the scene in time to see them put the fire out on these three smoldering corpses in his in his restaurant. And um, and then he had to deal with the consequences of this, and he was messed up for weeks, weeks. We he was inconsolable. We Jeremy who's one of the best people that ever lived, did what I didn't have the common sense to do, namely take up a collection for um, for the uh, wait staff there, and we got him a couple grand or something just to tide him over through through this thing because they'd been so good to us and we liked them so much. And, and a week after this car went through the restaurant, he was sullen and despondent and, and depressed and has been for a while because his business is... is not ruined. His business is coming back. His business will be back. He took a hit. People died in his property, and that messed him up for months. And I think that's a sign of humanity that that messed him up for months. But the president of the United States, apparently, can hear that his ambassador is being, uh, certainly knew that his embassy and his ambassador were under attack with machine guns and rocket-propelled grenades. We've seen the bloody fingerprints on the pillars there at that embassy where American citizens were taken out horizontally blood streaks horizontally as they're being pulled out into the mob to be sodomized and murdered to and and the president hears that this stuff is going on and decides he's going to go up and go to bed i i'm out of outrage i'm out of things i'm out i i got nothing left i don't know what to say anymore when i hear stories like this i just don't i don't know what to say anymore it bothers me that i am so burned out at, at disgust and disgrace for the office of the President of the United States and, by extension, my country and my flag. I don't know what to do anymore, except for everything I can to get this unbelievable person out of that office while there's still something left. Anyway. Elisa's question is, do I think the liberals will be successful in claiming they never said that this happened? I don't think they'll be successful. And the reason I don't think they'll be successful is not because of the media, which is not which, the media. Listen, folks, I believe you, you've just heard me do a, what, a, a 20 minute rant on how I feel about Barack Obama. But I'll tell you this. I would trade another 10 years. I would trade two more terms. I trade eight more years of Barack Obama if it meant at the end of the additional eight years for a grand total of 12 years of this ruin we would be guaranteed that the media would be destroyed as we know it today. If it took another eight years of Barack Obama to destroy the media and this this information, this control, this one-sided control of what the American citizen hears and, and doesn't hear, it would be worth it, I think. It would be worth it to watch every institution in this country burn to the ground so long as the American people had a chance at the end of it to get unvarnished information without 30, 40, 50 points of spin. That's what this is coming down to. This is what it's just coming down to. I swear to God, I, two weeks ago, prior to the debate, which I'm going to get to in a minute, prior to the debate, I thought this media was going to steal this election again. Because, frankly, when Evan Thomas said famously that he thought media bias was worth 15 points in 2004, it was worth more than that in 2008. But even if it was only worth 15 points in 2008, if you flow 15 points off of the 2008 Electoral College results, Obama carries D.C. and Delaware. And that's all. McCain wins 309 electoral votes or some 320. I don't know what the number was. Gigantic number. Right? So, uh, Monster says, Bill, in another eight years, there'll be no America. There will be Americans, Monster. Uh, the entire in the entire, uh, all of the institutions that we know and respect may be destroyed, but Americans will be there and Americans can rebuild. If this media is not destroyed, they will continue to poison these generation after generation after generation. The media must be destroyed. It's more important than beating Democrats. It's more important than voting Barack Obama out of office. It's more important than liberalism. It's more important than progressivism. The media must be destroyed. And this is what Andrew Breitbart understood completely. The media must be destroyed. They must be destroyed because it's not a media. We talk about it like it's an information gathering society. It's the steno pool for the Democratic Party masquerading as news. It must be destroyed. It must be destroyed. It has to be destroyed. And if we have a chance to elect Mitt Romney for president, then we have to destroy it from the inside. 
we have to destroy it. It has to be destroyed. Any subsidies that go to, to uh, these companies have to be completely eliminated. The American people have to get out there and they have to start protesting the media. They have to start protesting ABC News. If you want to save your country, we need to have Tea Party events outside of ABC News and make it clear to them that we know what they're doing. ABC, NBC, CBS, MSNBC is such a joke. I don't even care about them. I want to keep them around to keep me sane. But honestly, the, the New York Times, the LA Times, they must be made to feel they must be openly called out. See, this is the thing. This is the thing. It's getting to some questions that we have coming downstream. And if I don't move on, there's not going to be a downstream. You have to understand the kind of person that becomes a reporter is not terribly different from the kind of person that becomes an actor. They have the same unbridled need for approval. They have that same black hole of emptiness in their souls, except that an actor has an emotional need, and I think a reporter tends to have more of an intellectual emotional need. They need to be seen to be the good guys. They love this image of themselves as the, as the cub reporter, you know, out on the streets late at night uncovering the corruption in the giant machine. When they're doing that, they're actually useful. When they're actually doing that, they're doing what they're supposed to do, which is keeping this country free for 250 years. Because I'm not one of those people that say conservatives aren't corrupt. Everybody's corrupt. That's the idea of conservatism, isn't it, right? People are corrupt. Human nature is not noble. You need watchdogs and people to uncover these things. And when the media is doing those things, I don't care if they're uncovering Republican corruption. I really don't even care if they're being unfairly oh boy, aggressive in terms of, of, of Republican administrations, because I'd rather have a media that was overly aggressive than one that's lulled to sleep and is essentially just not even a lapdog. We left lap, lapdog behind in 2008. We're now talking about a corrupt information system that is directly complicit with an administration determined to remove liberties from the American people. And they are not only aiding and abetting, they are in fact in front of the fight. Because when you watch the media after this last debate debacle, Barack Obama thought he did great. It was the media tools that leapt into action on this Benghazi thing, right? It was the media that accused Mitt Romney of being out of line because Mitt Romney had the temerity to come out and say, I don't think that American citizens should give up their First Amendment freedoms in order to pacify a bunch of savages on the other side of the world. What? It was the media that did that. That wasn't the White House. That was the media that did that. We can't let this stand. Why can't you let that stand? Because if the American people heard that from Mitt Romney, they would agree with him. And the ultimate thing about the Benghazi thing and this, and this attack on the, on the embassy is really very simple. Namely, that Barack Obama's foreign policy can be sub succinctly described as, I am Barack Obama, the world is different now. And this is not my spin on it. You've heard him say it. He says it verbatim. He goes to Cairo and apologizes because he thinks that by his transformational appearance in America, his transfer, just the essence of him, the rest of the world will love us now. So don't you see how obvious this is? When an embassy burns and a sitting ambassador is murdered for the first time in whatever it was, 33 years, don't you understand that what's really at stake when you see an American embassy burning and flags burning is Barack Obama's ego is burning? Don't you see this is why this has to happen? Not just his ego, but the entire State Department's foreign policy, which is, well, now that we have Barack Obama, who was raised by Muslims, we won't have any problem with the Muslims. Muslims are going to love us. Don't you remember how we were sold this during the 2008 election? We've got to change this Bush cowboyism. And if we elect Obama, the world will love us. Well, the media elites loved us for a little while anyway, until we started to realize that we weren't going to help them out with their economic mess. And in fact, we're helping to drive it. So slowly you began to lose the Europeans, but we were told that the, oh, the Islam Muslims are going to love America, going to show America. America's going to show them that we're really, we're so advanced, you know, we're so morally advanced that we've elected a guy whose middle name is Hussein, which is Arabic for great one, is my understanding. Um, don't you understand that that burning embassy meant that Barack Obama's foreign policy was a lie and that his promises were a lie and that his personal ego was on the stake? Why do you think they sacrificed that idiot filmmaker down there? And he is an idiot. That filmmaker down there is an idiot and he's a D-bag and he's a, he's a bottom dweller and he did horrible things to his cast. He, he overdubbed their lines. He should be sued, frankly, for what he did, but he should not be put in jail because he made that movie. President of the United States sacrificed that man because they needed something to pull attention from the fact that his promise of being a transformational figure was a lie. And those of us who knew it was a lie from the beginning 
we're not surprised to find out. God, I could just talk about this all night, and sometimes I think I need to either that or drink myself into oblivion because I just don't know what to do about this. Except, except vote this guy out of office because I'll tell you folks, I'm getting to the point now where I'd, I'd, almost, I'd almost rather watch Congress, I'd almost rather watch this Washington burn to the ground in order to watch the face on this man on Wednesday morning when he's handed this defeat. I've, I've become, I'm, 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 I think I'm becoming unhinged. And I worry about becoming unhinged. But then I also say, is that unhinged or is it unhinged to not be outraged about this kind of treason, about selling out our fundamental principles? Isn't that unhinged? Isn't it unhinged, unhinged to say, well, I haven't really made up my mind yet? Or I'm, a, I'm an American patriot and I, and I can't vote for this Romney fellow because, because I don't like his position on health care. I don't like his position on... That's unhinged. You can't watch what this guy is doing to this country and not feel a sense of utter dismay and utter disbelief and utter disgust. So stay frosty, my friends, and uh, get out there and vote this guy out of office and take any single person you possibly can who would not have voted otherwise because they're going to cheat. They're going to cheat two or three percentage points. Two or three percentage points of cheating is going to occur on the part of the Democratic Party. Uh, Project Veritas, um, uh, James O'Keefe, who's an actual honest-to-God genius, has video of Democratic operatives gleefully handing him Texas ballots in Michigan or wherever he was, saying, hey, vote, go vote for Obama in, I'm sorry, must be Michigan ballots, ballots in Texas, something like that, right? Here are some ballots from a swing state. Go out and vote for Obama, and uh, there you go. There you go. Um, so anyway, yeah, uh, uh, Cyan Naviat says his first time here, he's seeing a very different Bill Whittle from his videos. Yes, uh, he is seeing a very different Bill Whittle. This is, by the way, uh, you're, you're seeing me about as angry as I get ever. Um, but the entire purpose of this is to, is to get away from the script and to get off of the control. And for my people on Facebook who, who've taken the time to hit the like button and, and who, who have taken the time to leave questions, I think people who, uh, who follow my work on Facebook are entitled to see how I really feel about things. And, 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 and this goes to a question I got right near the end, and I'm going to bring it up now because it actually works pretty well. Um, Fernando um, Pombiero says that I'm a person, as a person with very good ideas, thank you, and the future potential for creating Whittle derangement syndrome with leftists as my star uh, witnesses apparently continues to rise. Do I have concerns about opening my door to my personal life? Um, yes, I have concerns, and no, they don't stop me, um, Fernando. Here's why this is important to me, and here's why I don't mind going off like this, because unlike people on the left, specifically politicians, my personal beliefs and my public beliefs are not antithetical to each other. My political beliefs and my business beliefs and the stuff I do as a, as a pundit, which is an occupation I never in a million years thought I'd find myself in, um, are in line with my personal beliefs, so I'm not worried about saying something I'm going to regret later because my work is based on how I feel. And whatever um, whatever uh, brand I have, if I'm going to reduce it to such a clinical term, I like to think is a brand that's, that is based upon the confluence of intellect and emotion. I am not Victor Davis Hanson uh, or Thomas Sowell. I don't have that kind of self-control. I wish I did many times. Other times, I'm glad I don't. Other times, I think that the ability to get passionate and emotional about things is important and that it moves people in a way that a strictly intellectual approach doesn't move people. But I do not let ever, ever let my passions overcome my intellect to the degree where I will overlook contrary evidence or I will willingly lie about something. And I get sick, I get physically ill when I think I've made a mistake on something that's already gone out. When something's gone out and somebody says this isn't true, I just start to get the shakes. It doesn't happen very often. I think it's happened maybe twice, twice or three times, and it makes me crazy. Even something as stupid as that Romney gun thing I did, which was just a gag, it was just a lark. I was feeling ecstatic over the Romney thing, and I put it out there, and I put September 3rd instead of October 3rd, and it just made me ill to be wrong. I don't like being wrong, and as I've said a hundred times here, I will, I will, if I'm presented with evidence that I'm wrong and it's compelling evidence, I'll change my mind. I'll publicly change my mind, and if I've done something 
where I've accused somebody of something, I'll publicly apologize. That's what people with integrity do. As far as the personal life is concerned, I don't care. I don't care about people knowing about my personal life. I don't care, you know, I don't advertise where I live, but I don't care if they find out where I live. I've just talked about a restaurant in Studio City and you know, people know where I am and what I do and where I live more or less, I don't care. And I've had people tell me I should care. I've had people that care about me say, you should be careful. And I am careful, but I decided at the beginning of this thing real early in 2003 when I was doing eject, 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 that I do not want to live my life in fear. I'm not going to live my life in fear of somebody walking up to me with a pistol someday as I'm pulling out of my apartment or pulling into my apartment. If somebody's going to do that, I can't stop it. Uh, but if I am going to let the thought or the possibility of that stop me from saying what I think is true and affecting other people, maybe changing some minds or maybe um, keeping up spirits, if I'm going to let the fear of that stop me, then that's cowardice, in my opinion. Um, and I, I'm just not afraid of that. Uh, I'm not afraid of that. And I'm also not afraid of it because of something that happened um, actually relatively late in my life. I've talked about uh, the, the glider flight that I took and, and, and how it was um, just w one day I took a, a flight that was simply so unbelievable. Just, just, I just saw such things and I just started flying and just the ability to be a pilot had made such an impression on me that I remember I went home thinking I don't care if anything happens to me after this. Uh, and I've had many experiences in my life where I've um, had moments where I just look in awe at what I've done and just been amazed that I could have been so fortunate to have had a life like this. So the other reason I don't worry about it and the other reason I don't worry about both the physical threat and the uh, career threat is I've lived a life that's amazing by any standards and I don't think I'm done yet. I got a lot of stuff I absolutely want to do, but even if I don't get to do them, I've, I've done things that are beyond my ability to believe. And when you live a, a life like that, you you find yourself s somehow not too afraid of, of, of uh, guys with guns or, or you know, car crashes or, or people calling you out or losing your job or whatever. Uh, and not just things either, people, the people in my life, the quality of the people in my life, people like Dana and, and, and Jeremy and, and my friend Fritz Bronner and uh, the, the kind of people and, and my professional colleagues. Uh, and I get, I get a chance to answer another question here. Which I know I'm all over the place today, but... Anyway, uh, Jason Metzger had a question. He said, although you talk to them multiple times a week for the taping of your shows, have you ever met Scott Ott and Steve Green in real life? Uh, and do you all even get along? Yeah, we meet. I've met them two or three times. They're awesome, fantastic guys. You can tell how much I like them by how often I'll insult them. And um, Andrew Claven, who I work with every two weeks at PJTV, is a guy who I introduce every week with an insult. That's how a lot of men function. And I'm not one of those guys who's afraid to or, or doesn't have the emotional uh, reserves to tell them how much I love them and how much I admire them to their face. I do that often, but on camera, I like to insult them. Uh, so not only, the, not only the things that I've done and not only the uh, people that I have in my life personally, but also the people that I get to work with professionally. It's mind-boggling, mind-boggling for, just mind-boggling to have a guy like Bert Rutan say, I really admire you. I'm really glad you're a friend of mine. I don't know what to do with that. And, and a number of celebrities, including Clint Eastwood, who I gave a copy of my book to. And, you know, I gave it to him as a throwaway, just as almost as like a, a burnt offering at his feet, you know. And two months later, he comes up to me and says, I, I read your book and I really liked it. I, yeah, it explodes when you hear things like this. And, and, and there's a lot of people that I can't name who are you know, famous celebrities and, and, and conservatives and just come up to me and, and, and people stop me in the Staples Center or outside the streets of the, on the steps of the Capitol building, I got stopped and said, are you Bill Whittle? And, and, and the, you, the, the, every single day on Facebook with you people, every single day on Facebook, the things that you write about me is just unbelievable. And I, I just, every day, I just go, who, who, who has a life like this? So, uh, I don't 
worry about personal details getting out. I don't worry about threats to me. I have to say this too, and this is weird. I can't really explain this, but certainly compared to a guy like Andrew Breitbart, I don't get a lot of personal threats. In fact, I can only remember one real personal threat, and that was from somebody on our team, and it happened on Twitter, and I gave the guy my phone number and said, if you're going to threaten my life, you'd better do it to my face. You better get on the phone and make that threat in person. And uh, he got on the phone and he walked that threat back, and that was the end of that. So um, I don't like being threatened. I don't like people being threatened anonymously, uh, threatening me anonymously. I don't like it, and I won't tolerate it. And this is another reason why I'm armed uh, and why I wish, in a place like I, lived, I wish I lived in a place like Texas, where right here in California, you have the legal right to have a weapon, but you don't have the moral right, and everything... Um, Everything that you do out here, you have to realize, you know, you, this is part of your calculation out here. There may come a time when I may have to pull a trigger on one of those weapons, and I will not have the same peace of mind doing that as I would in Texas. I don't think you ever have peace of mind when you pull a trigger on somebody, but, you know, here you know that you're going to be the um, aggressor, even if you're defending your life. You just ask Zimmerman how that feels. Um, California, you will be you will be considered guilty. But again, there's so many little pearls of wisdom out there in the world, and one of the great ones from the uh, from the uh, gun community is it's it's better to be tried by 12 men than carried by six, and uh, that's kind of how I feel about that too. So um, anyway, yeah, you know the the because of the work I've done, I've been invited to watch rocket motors launch and 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 watch spaceships go into space, and I've been invited to. Guantanamo Bay and, and and stood on top of that hill down there underneath those giant windmills and looked down at, at this little piece of America in the middle of this communist country and then you turn your shoulder and over there and there's a little gleaming spot on the beach a couple miles away and there sit the worst people in the world and I'm talking to the people that keep them away from the rest of us and the, just the raw honor of it and the, and the chance to go down to have somebody say come on down and sit in the F-18 simulators which is what you've always wanted to do your entire life. It's amazing. It's amazing. And so Things like the Stratosphere Lounge and opening up personally are things that are such a small, in, it, it, it's such a small offering. It's almost, it, it's almost, in, it's almost embarrassing how little this is in terms of paying people back. But it's something I can do and something I like to do. So it's something I will do. And um, that's pretty much the end of that. And I'm, I'm glad to be calming down a little bit because, frankly, every time I think about this Benghazi thing. And I think about that ambassador, and I think about his his calls for help, and I think about how he died, and the other three Americans, and I think about those horizontal, those horizontal bloody fingerprints on a pillar. Horizontal, they were they were being held up above a crowd and pulled out of the. I, I just can't bear it. I can't bear it. And if it if I had been the president of the United States of America, sometimes you have to make snap decisions. But I'll tell you what I would have done. If you have a crowd of people on a street that are pulling our people out, you cannot simply go in there and cluster bomb these people. You don't know where the friendlies are. And frankly, there are a lot of innocent bystanders there that are not responsible for this. But if I had been the president of the United States in Barack Obama's shoes and I am about to retire for the evening and I hear that our embassies are under RPG and or a consulate, RPG and machine gun fire, and there is some danger of our ambassador or our amb ambassadorial staff either being killed, maybe killed, had been killed, or whatever. I will tell you what I would do as a snap decision. This was the first line, first thing I thought when I when this situation was made clear to me. I would have said to my to my um, defense secretary, I would have said, I want as many F-18s as we can put over that city, and I want them 100 feet above the deck, and I want them in excess of Mach 1, and I want a perpetual string of sonic booms over that embassy. I want sonic booms for an hour. I want them coming in, and I want them in a racetrack, and I just want them to tell these people again and again and again for an hour that we are here that we are here in the moment. We are here now. I don't want any munitions dropped until we know who's responsible. I don't want any I don't want any actions taken until we know who's responsible for this, but I want the people of that city, the people in that embassy, and I want whatever Americans that are on the ground there to know that we are here. I just want boom, and I want that boom every freaking minute for the duration. I want those people to know who they're messing with. 
That's what I would do as president of the United States. And if we have to write a check for some broken windows, then they can bill us. They can bill our State Department. Boom! I want those booms coming again. I want those people knowing who they're messing with. And I want them to know that there's no confusion on the part of President Woodle in terms of which side he's on and whether or not we're going to arm our Marines in our embassies in Egypt either. There's not going to be any question about that either. Boom! I want those booms. I want those booms over that city. I want those people to be aware that there are consequences for pulling our people horizontally out of an embassy and dragging them out to their deaths. And I want them to know it in the moment. That's why we have F-18s. That's why we have aircraft carriers. That's why we have these brave men and women out there on the line all the time. Boom! I want them just to constantly hear it. I want them to hear it all night long. And I want them to worry about it. Animals. You know, if you don't want sonic booms over your city, maybe you shouldn't murder and, and, and sodomize our ambassadors. You might want to put that into your calculations for next time. Boom! Again, I want them to think about it all the time. Frickin' animals. And, you know, of all the animals out there with this thing, I'll tell you who the real animals are. The actual, genuine animals, the actual people who are subhuman in my mind are the people in the State Department and the liberals who think that we mirror them, that, that actually think that we are dealing with Canada, that we're at war with Canada, that what we really need to do is just be nice to them. And, and they've murdered a few of our ambassadors and they've killed a few of our people and beaten them to death or stoned them to death or whatever. So what we need to do is give them another couple hundred million dollars to appease them and, and show them that we're actually swell guys. Those are the actual subhumans in this thing, in my opinion, because honest to God, I do not understand how a person with an education and an intellect can, can take that position unless there is something missing from them, that there's something fundamentally missing from them, that they can't even see which side they're on in their own fight. I, I swear to God, of, of all the things I say that are the, the most controversial thing I think I can ever say is this. I despise these 7th century savages. I despise them. I absolutely despise and abhor them. And I think their time to be on this earth is long past us. If they want to live that way, that's their business. If, we, if, if these people cannot even be trusted with something as simple as a diplomatic mission, then we pull our people out of there and let them, let them burn. I don't care. They can, they can live in the world of their own creation. I don't care. But the people on our team who take their sides over our side, who take the side of these, of these people, they are the subhuman ones. They are the people that are missing something. There's something absolutely wrong with them. And I at least respect these people on some level in the streets of Benghazi in a way that I never respect and cannot possibly respect these liberal intellectuals who sit in this bubble of prosperity and security paid for by the lives of American soldiers and American ambassadors and sit there in their hot tubs and drink their Chardonnay and side with those people. Those are the people who I absolutely, absolutely abhor and will not ever find a way to be able to respect in any way whatsoever. At least these animals are fighting for what they believe in right they're fighting for what they believe in but these people in their in their in their their cocktail parties in new york city talking about how oh well it's our fault you see it's what we do to them it's what we it's, our, it's us it's us it's us it's me it's me it's me it's me go to hell go burn in hell you do not deserve to be a part of this country you do not deserve the things that have been given to you you don't deserve them you don't deserve them you do not get to waste these kind of things consciously the way that you do and, 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 and be an American. I can't understand it. I can't understand it. I just can't understand it. <sighs> All right. Mark McConnell wants to know if there's any chance that President Romney will appoint an attorney general that will prosecute any of the many illegal activities committed by, the Obama, by Obama and members of his administration. Uh, up until a conversation I had with a terrific guy named uh, Brad, uh, who's a really brilliant, and not only brilliant intellectually, but a good, decent man, a, a really, a, a good man, a good man with morals. He clued me into something. I, I thought the position was, no, you know what? If you win, just move on. Don't dig this up. The best revenge, the best response is to simply succeed and, and, and have the business world boom and have jobs appear. That's the best revenge against Barack Obama. But he, he told me differently, and he changed my mind. Um, he changed my mind. I think absolutely we need to have 
an attorney general who's going to dig into things like Fast and Furious. I think we need to have an attorney general that's going to look into voter fraud. I think the one thing that has to happen immediately if Romney wins, and I mean within the first 100 days, is uh, of all the things that Romney can do, I, I personally would put this, uh, I know this is going to sound controversial, but I believe this. I would put this ahead of repealing Obamacare. Immediately, we must make a full court press to have a verifiable, legitimate, uncorruptible electoral system in this country. We have got to retain and return to a, a credible, verifiable system of counting votes in this country. And if that means we've devolved ourselves into a third world country, and if it means that we need blue ink on our fingers for a day, then that's a thing I'm proud to do. Right? We have got to get this electoral system under control because if we cannot trust our electoral system, our entire idea of our country falls apart. And furthermore, if Barack Obama is reelected, I am fairly convinced he can corrupt the system to the point where we will not be able to win again in the future. We should insist that people, if you have to cash a check, if you have to, if you have to have an ID to cash a check, if you have to have an ID to get on a on an airplane, if you have to have an ID to do anything in this country, and you don't have to have an ID to vote, and we are the only country in the world that doesn't require an ID to vote, this disease of of moral superiority has to be rooted out. But that's going to take two generations. We have got to immediately start by saying we need to have a verifiable paper ballot that can be counted and recounted by a machine. We need to make it clear to the American people that if you, your vote is an action, your vote is a right, but your vote is also an action. You must successfully complete this action in order to vote. This action requires that you have an ID. And frankly, this sad tales we hear about how, oh, inner city people don't have IDs. Nonsense. They don't have IDs. Of course they have IDs. But even if they didn't have IDs, what I'm saying is if you don't think it's important enough to get an ID to vote, then you don't deserve to vote. Right? You have an opportunity to vote. You don't have an obligation to vote. No one's going to make you vote. If you deprive people of an opportunity to vote, that's one thing. But if that means going to get an ID or, or going to voter registration form and filling out a voter registration form, that's what you need. Right? It is a corrupt system. It needs to be fixed immediately, and it needs to be done immediately. And we need to take it to the American people. And we need to do one thing which is so fundamental, I can't understand why I don't hear this every day. It's because our team doesn't know. Our team doesn't know how to argue what we believe. Our team doesn't even know how to argue the fundamentals of what we believe. That's why I'm here, folks. Look, you will hear people like Sarah Silverman and, and, and the rest of these deep, deep, mor morally advanced people saying, look, Voter fraud may be a problem, but voter suppression is the real issue because it may be one thing to have somebody vote who, who maybe wasn't legally able to vote, but the real crime, the crime against democracy and our core beliefs is, is when somebody who, who should be allowed to vote is deprived of his vote. Voter suppression is a much, much, much more heinous crime than voter fraud. And what you have to say to the American people very succinctly, very clearly is this, voter fraud is voter suppression. Voter fraud is voter suppression. Because if somebody illegally votes for Barack Obama, they are taking away the vote of somebody who legally votes for Mitt Romney. They are canceling his vote. If a guy in Michigan fills out a form and votes in Texas for Obama, I got that backwards again. If a guy in Texas, a liberal in Texas, has a Michigan absentee ballot and fills it out and votes twice and commits voter fraud and mails it into Michigan, and Michigan goes to Obama when it would have gone to Romney if it had been legal. That is voter suppression. They're suppressing the votes of every single legal person who voted for Mitt Romney. Every single false vote for Barack Obama suppresses the vote of a legal voter who voted for Mitt Romney. It's suppression. It's stealing their vote. An election essentially is a, is a piling up of red and blue chips. Red chip, blue chip, red chip, blue chip. And everybody's votes cancel everybody else's votes out. And whoever's got the most chips at the end wins. And if you are illegally stacking that chip deck with votes that don't count, you are stealing the result of people who voted legally. Don't ever let them get away with it again. Next time you hear somebody talk about voter suppression and voter fraud, and we say, well, it's just voter fraud. It's voter suppression. Voter fraud is voter suppression. 
You've got to get out there and you've got to make this case to the American people and then you have to defy these liberal sons of bitches. You have to defy them. You have to make them get up on the ground. See, this is what Breitbart understood. You never give these people the moral high ground. Ever, 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 ever. They don't deserve it. They'll never, ever, ever deserve it. So you get out there and you say to the American people, I think that every American who's eligible to vote should vote and that every single person who's not eligible to vote should not vote. And that's how we should determine our elections in this country. Every single person voting one time legally. Now you come out and tell me why this is a bad idea. Come out, make the case, Democrats. Make the case for why dead people should be voting. Make the case for why people should be voting two, three times in two or three different states. Make the case for why illegal aliens should be voting. Make the case to the American people, but make them make the case. Don't just sit there and take this ongoing abuse, which is what we do. Oh, well, voter suppression. The attorney general said, well, we're not going to investigate voter fraud. We're only going to investigate voter suppression. Somebody, if there was a media, this is what a media would be for. And by the way, you proud members of the press, you need to understand that if you were doing your jobs, then guys like Eric Holder wouldn't be allowed. They wouldn't be able to do these kind of heinous crimes like Fast and Furious and these kind of things. So make Attorney General come out and say, uh, well, we're only going to investigate voter suppression, not voter fraud. Voter fraud is voter suppression. Make him, make him defend it. Make the Democrats defend it. Make them just come out and say, what are you guys afraid of? What are you afraid of? I'm saying that every single American who should be able to vote should vote. I'm saying that every single American has a sacred right to vote and that everybody should get one vote. What are you saying? And why are you saying it? Why is it that you don't want to know who's voting? Why is it that you think it should be allowed for people to vote twice? Why are you saying it should be something that, you, that can even be done? Why? Why do you think you have to vote twice? Why? Put them on the spot. But no, we don't. We got a lot to do if Mitt Romney wins this thing, and I think Mitt Romney's going to win this thing big. Um, let's see. I've got uh, another f five minutes, probably. I can go another five, ten minutes, something like that. Yeah, I know I've gone off the rails tonight, guys. I feel so bad about you going all the trouble to write these questions and then me just flying off, but that's what happens sometimes. Um, yeah, let's just go off and do something a little different here. Um, Pat... Uh, Bigos, I guess, says you once mentioned living in Australia. Did that shape any of your values? I lived in Australia for three months uh, in 1998. I, I had an utter business failure here in L.A., and I was at the end of my rope, and my uncle, who lives in Australia, said, come on down and spend some time. I said, okay. And it did change a lot of, of my values. First of all, it made me miss home, even L.A., which, needless to say, I bash all the chance I get. But when I was, when I was down in Australia, I was... Um, I took a day off and drove up a little north. I was in Brisbane. I was on the uh, east coast of Australia. And I drove about an hour north and went to the nicest beach I've ever been on. And I've been on some good beaches in Bermuda and other places where I've lived. And um, I was taking a, a swim in the Coral Sea, and I looked out over the horizon. I said, out there somewhere is California and Los Angeles. And for somebody in show business, after three months in Australia, you begin to re forget about show business. After three months in Australia, and I loved Australia, I loved the people, I loved everything about them. But when you live in Australia and you come from America, you realize that America is the center of the universe. Uh, I was on an airplane. I was flying into Australia. I got off the plane in Sydney, took the, the commuter flight from Sydney to Brisbane. And I struck up a conversation with a guy, lovely conversation, and a person next to me said, listen, mate, I want to talk to you about some of the things your State Department's done. And I, and I and he starts going off on American foreign policy. This was Clinton. And he just unloaded on me. And I turned to him. I said, well, I'll, I'll have a word with the president as soon as I return home. And uh, the other Australian guy apologized for him. But it's amazing, really. You know, it's like Australian citizens or Canadian citizens or anybody else, that they, they find out you're an American. In Germany and Europe, this is epidemic. This is why many people say they're Canadians. I consider those people ca cowards and, and, and sort of traitors light. You deny your own identity abroad because you're embarrassed about it. I, I couldn't do that. But um, what you find out is America is such the center of the universe that common citizens of another country will come up to a common citizen like you and unload on you because you're the center of their world. And I think I might have mentioned this once before. It was my favorite, one of my favorite moments of my entire life. I got, this was a while ago too, this was a good, good long while ago. 
got into an online argument, you know how it gets, you know, with these flame wars with these uh, people about American uh, military and stuff. And, and I got, into, got really hot with this one Russian guy. He was telling me about how stupid we are and responsible for all the problems of the world and this and this and this and this and this and, this and how every single person in Russia hates Americans and, and despises them and, 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 you know, that we're just the worst people in the world. And, and I remember saying to him, I said, okay, all your friends in Russia hate and despise Americans. You know what all my friends say about Russians? We don't say anything. We don't say anything about Russians. We don't think about you at all. We don't have t-shirts with Russian uh, Cyrillic characters on it. We don't talk about Russian pop stars because we don't know who they are. We don't talk about Russian politics because we don't care. We don't talk about Russia's effect on the world because we know that you're basically a brutal country and really you're kind of in a cage right now. We don't talk about you at all because we don't care. And I thought that I could just see the air come out of this guy. Even, even on text, you know, on a screen, just watch the air come out of him. And I really think that's what drives people crazy about America, but I also think that's our greatest response to them, truthfully, is, well, the, the, the German people or the British people or, we, or you Yanks, 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 you Want to know what we think about your people? Yes, what do you think about us? You hate us too. No, we don't hate you at all. We don't think about you. You don't cross our minds. The BAFTAs happened. I don't care who, 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 who's at the BAFTAs. The only people that are at the BAFTAs that are recognizable are British actors who are in American movies. I'm sorry, it's true. It just, you have to live overseas to appreciate how much America is the center of the universe. And I find it interesting that when you talk about, I've, I've heard anecdotally, I've heard this story a hundred times but people will bash America to you if you're an American. Bash, 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 bash. And when you're going back home, there's a moment where they just go, you're leaving? Yes, my brother lived in uh, East End of London for a while, a pretty low-rent neighborhood. They said, you're going? They said, yeah. Where are you going? I'm going back to California, I'm going to go, go back to San Diego. And you could just see it. You just see that, that sense of he's getting out of this place and going back to California where he's going to have a, a you know a damned big house and two damned cars and burn all the damned gasoline and eat all the damned food and use all the damned energy and blah 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 blah, 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 blah. he's going to go back to that place and do those things and I'm going to be stuck here in this place for the rest of my life it's uh, it's amazing even in Canada um, which was a lovely place. Toronto is such a, everything they say about Toronto is true, true, clean, decent, sweet, uh, polite country uh, and a city, you know, right across the river is American cities that are filthy and all this stuff. Uh, uh, by the way, I just saw a line that says Polish and Ukrainian people are really nice. That's true. I think the Eastern Europeans have the best attitudes toward American. They're certainly the people I like the best in the world. I love I love the Poles. I love them. I love the Poles and the Czechs and the, and the Romanians. And I, I just love them. I think they're absolutely the best people in the world. They understand what's at stake here. That's why they like us. Um, but all of this American politics, and I don't know if you remember this, folks, but I think it was back in 2008 during the uh, Obama election where people, I know certainly what happened during the Kerry election in 2004 where people in a British town decided to adopt an American town and they picked the people in something Massachusetts or someplace like this and wrote them all letters about why they had to get rid of George Bush, fully understanding the American temperament, of course, and, and knowing that we just wait for people in Europe to tell us how to vote because there's nothing that, that makes me more want to vote for a guy than having some complete stranger in Britain telling me that it's absolutely essential that I vote for the guy that he wants. Um, but uh, there was some serious talk during the last two elections when Bush was uh, around that serious talk that um, that other people should get a chance to vote in America's elections. Other countries, people of the world should get a chance to vote in the American election because the American presence was so great in the world. I just laughed and laughed and I was so proud of that. I was like, yeah, okay. Ain't never gonna happen, but, uh, sorry, but um, it's a thought, isn't it? I was talking about being up in Canada and Toronto and everything's about the American election and, and, and 
how's it going to affect uh, here and there? And, and I'll tell you something, by the way, just so you know, th know that I'm not just exclusively wallowing in my own crapulence here. Uh, it is a hard thing for an American patriot to go to Canada and, and realize he's getting off the ground in a country with a, with a different flag and that country has more political freedom and more economic freedom and a higher per capita GDP. Uh, that's, that is not an easy thing to take. Uh, when we were talking uh, on, uh, I guess it was uh, Sun TV, um, talking about the C Canadian Prime Minister and the Canadian, uh, current Canadian government, which is solving its debt problems rather spectacularly and has actually got a civic federal government that seems to be working pretty well. Uh, I repeatedly said, this Prime Minister of yours is a wonder and can we have him? Would you trade? We could, I think I could talk to my friends in the conservative half of the country, and I think we could attach a significant dollar value to this offer, frankly. Um, we'd, like, uh, we'd like Mr. Harper quite a lot. Um, I think it's Harper. Uh, so um, anyway, yeah, it's, it's really um, amazing. You don't appreciate it until you leave it. And uh, I missed America when I was gone for three months, the longest I've ever been away. I lived overseas. Of course, I grew up in Bermuda. Um, and I sang God Save the Queen every morning for the first half of my life as a child. The first half of my school days, anyway. I woke up every day in my little blazer and put my little tie on and my little patch and crest on my blazer and go to school and watch the Union Jack go up and sing God Save the Queen every morning. Um, and it's lovely. It is. Uh, but it really is, it really is something to be here. Um, I could do another hour without any trouble whatsoever, uh, but I really do want to hear what Scott Rasmussen has to say because that's going to affect my work. Uh, I'll be sure to pass it on to you and let you know. Uh, he's a super guy. I met him at Right Online. He's a really, really nice man on top of being a, the only guy who seems to understand what's actually going on out there. And I actually never believed these polls that were showing Obama that far ahead, but certainly that debate, something, something happened. Uh, let me just close by talking about the debate, which I didn't get a chance to talk to talk about yet, and I'll talk about it, debate some more. Um, I have said for three and a half years now that with this media bias, bias, and bias is not a term I use anymore. Bias, we're past bias. Certainly, this Cairo Benghazi thing is we're past bias now. Media corruption on the part of the Democrat, Democratic Party steno pool, their audio visual department. Um, The debate was the debate was the only time, and I've been saying this, like I said, for a while, is the only time there's, let's say they're 90 minutes each, right? So three presidential debates, it's three and a half, four and a half hours, five hours, maybe six. Those five hours are the only chance that the American people have to watch the actual candidates be themselves without the media telling them what to think. They don't get to spin it, and you can tell it drives them crazy. You can tell it drives the president crazy. You can tell that President Obama finds this entire idea way beneath him, the idea that he has to go out and justify himself to these rubes and these hicks in flyover country. You can tell. It's obviously beneath him. But this is the only chance that the American people have to see people unspun. And when I saw Romney, I couldn't watch the first half of the debate. I only came late because I had friends watching it. I didn't want to watch it because, frankly, the thought of it made me ill. The pressure was just more than I could take. I just wanted to just find out how it went and read about it the next day. But I had friends watching it, so I went over and I got the last half of it. And, um, and I watched Romney, and I thought, you know, he's really doing well, and he's, he's well prepared, and he's very, very sharp intellectually. But I expected that from Romney. The thing I hadn't expected from Romney, the thing that surprised me about Romney's debate performance was how warm Romney was and how, and how compassionate he was coming off and how reasonable. And I remember the question about regulations where he started off by saying, look, we need regulations. Obviously, we need regulations. Can't run a business or a government without regulations. And I thought that's very, very, very clever and very smart because it's going opposite type. Romney is a Republican. They don't want rules. They want to be able to pillage the poor, starving poor at, at, uh, at their discretion. So I thought he was far more compassionate than I saw him. And people who know Romney, a guy I mentioned I talked to earlier, um, is, is active, uh, well active in the Mormon church and, and basically said that I thought that this town hall uh, debate coming up for Mitt was going to be the worst of the three for Mitt. 
because that kind of thing favors Obama, favors the Democrats to give him, you know, what's it like to be awesome like you? And, and I, Governor Gromney, your policies caused my wife to have cancer, and how do you justify that? That's what the town hall meetings are going to be like. And I thought, man, Romney's going to be fine. He's not going to lose this edge. He's not going to – he's just not going to open up any more of an advantage. And, and this guy said – who knows Romney and knows the Mormon church – said, no, actually, you're going to be surprised because when you get to deal with the humanity of people asking point blank personal questions, you're going to see the essential humanity and compassion of a man – who gave away his inheritance so that he could make his own way in the world and who's given away 30% of his income compared to Obama's 1%. And you're going to see a man who volunteered basically to run the Olympics for no pay, a job that you know is worth millions of dollars, and did, didn't do it, did it out of charity. I have some sympathy with the Randian position about too much charity and this idea, but, but Mitt Romney, would, by all accounts, by all accounts, is a, is a good man, a good compassionate, caring man. And he has such character that I didn't know about many of these things earlier because a man like Romney doesn't talk about these things. It makes me admire him even more. And so I suspect that when this town hall debate comes up and everybody thinks Obama's going to really just sail because the, the people are going to be at his back, first of all, I don't think the people are going to be at his back the way they were four years ago. Secondly, Obama knows how to pander, but Obama doesn't know how to connect. He doesn't know how to connect. And I think Romney's going to surprise us in that town hall meeting. I don't think Barack Obama can ever undo what happened at the debate. And unlike many people who think that Obama choked, I don't think that he choked so much as what happened was 70, mil 70, 70 million people got to see that the person who was standing there opposite Barack Obama was not the person that Barack Obama and $200 million made him out to. That's why Obama couldn't debate him, because Obama expected the guy from his campaign ads to show up. So when Mitt Romney appeared before the American people and came off as competent, um, reasonable, compassionate, and calm, and decent, and friendly, and nice, he flipped 12 points at the polls. How do you unflip that? Romney could bite the head off a bat, and, and I don't think it would really, first of all, I don't think as many people are going to watch. Secondly, you know, they, Mitt Romney's not going to bite the head off a bat, right? So Romney's elevation came somewhat at the expense of Obama's deflation, but mostly it was just, no, he's a real guy, and he's certainly smarter than Barack Obama. And by the way, how refreshing is this for us to finally have a debate where both the president and, needless to say, the vice presidential things, where the, where the Republicans are far smarter. You know, Barack Obama graduated from Harvard Law with a unknown uh, GPA, unknown sealed, because we all know that it was not a great GPA. Mitt Romney graduated from Harvard Law and business simultaneously or whatever, back to back with nine or 3.95 average or something. Mitt Romney has made a career in private equity by absolutely tough-minded negotiation against the brightest minds in the world. The best minds in the world don't go into government, they go into business. And Mitt Romney has sat opposite a table with them and convinced them that his side has more value than their side does for 30 years now. Mitt Romney is going to, is going to continue to dominate these debates. And I don't think Mitt Romney is going to be afraid to bring up Barack Obama's failure in Benghazi. And as that story begins to fall apart, I think Barack Obama is going to fall apart. And here's the thing I'm really looking forward to in the next presidential debate next week. Barack Obama is under such pressure from the left um, that he is going to come out swinging. And I've never seen in the four years that I've been following Barack Obama, I've never seen Barack Obama be strong or even be angry in a strong way. What I see Barack Obama do when he gets attacked is he gets thin-skinned, he gets mean, he gets testy, and he starts talking trash. And I think Barack Obama's idea of coming out swinging is to come out talking trash. And whatever is left of Barack Obama's personal likability is going to vaporize the minute that Barack Obama starts give, getting the impression that he has to go out and school Mitt Romney. He said to a Hollywood fundraiser after the debate, he said, I can't be expected to perform faultlessly night after night. You have to give me a night where I only do 95, 96 percent. This is why this guy's going to go down so hard, because he really does think that he is invincible. He, why wouldn't he believe it? He's a, he's a, he's a pathological narcissist. He's a, he's a, he's a basket case. He belongs in a mental institution. He needs treatment for his mental illness, Barack Obama. 
He's been lied and told this his entire life. Mitt Romney is going to stand there. Barack Obama is going to come out swinging. Barack Obama is going to look petty, mean, bitter, angry, which he is, thin-skinned, all of the things that we know he is. And in front of the rest of the population, including the liberals at MSNBC, this illusion, this glamour, by the way, the firewall that's coming out tomorrow is all about glamour. It's all about this idea of being entranced by a, by a shapeshifter. This glamour and this illusion is going to evaporate in the next two debates, and then you'll be left with, it's like that end of the Dark Crystal when the Skellix, those, uh, those bird creatures that have got all this giant, you know, all this pomp and all of these robes and majesty, and they finally have to take their clothes off, and you see them as just these skinny, you know, uh, chickens, basically. He's going to be revealed, I think, and I think we're going to win this election big. I've been saying we're going to win it big for a while because I don't think reality can be trifled with, and Barack Obama has to finally run against reality for the first time in his life. But, folks, I'll tell you what. I am. I'm really think we're going to win this thing. I'm going to find out from what Scott Rasmussen thinks because my opinion is irrelevant, but Rasmussen's opinion has some weight. Um, and I think we're going to win this thing, and, and I'm going to be looking forward to that Tuesday night. I'm going to be looking forward to the results coming in. I'm going to be looking forward to watching the, the polls and and call in the states and all that stuff. And when it's official, I'm going to be looking forward to that. I'm going to think about the work left to do to undo the work of Barack Obama and the previous administrations that have gotten us into this financial ruin. But the one thing I'm looking forward to more than anything in this world, I'm looking forward to this more than anything in this world, I am looking forward to Barack Obama's concession speech. I want to see that man's face when he is confronted with the reality of the fact that the people finally woke up to what he isn't. That's going to be a good day. Let's not get cocky out there, folks. There's still a lot that can happen, and uh, I just don't see how we can get it back. I don't. I think it's. I think the wheels are coming off, and I think if this next debate, he comes out swinging and his numbers go down, and Romney's lead increases, I think the media will then abandon him, only because, as I heard uh, better thinkers than me point out, it's intolerable for liberals that liberalism could be wrong. If they have to sacrifice their their golden child, if they have to sacrifice the unicorn, the messiah, the light, the light um, bringer, if they have to throw him under the bus, so long as liberalism itself is not destroyed by evidence, then they will do that. And we may still have enough time for the media and the rest of the liberals, if Obama does miserably in the next debate or two, we may still have enough time to watch them actually abandon him in droves and watch the wheels come off. But I don't even know if that's going to be necessary. I think things are going to good things are going to happen. It's 10 after, it's quarter after. My God, I got to get out of here. Uh, sorry about the short show tonight, and I know I was off of, uh, f fairly launched out of my chair earlier tonight. That's what happens at the Stratosphere Lounge. As always, I like to close these shows by pointing out to you uh, how much your Facebook uh, support and your financial support of PJTV, Declaration Entertainment, buying books, all that stuff has mean to me uh, over the years, and uh, it's given me a life that I simply can't recognize for the wonder of it. And I am still dating that movie star, and um, and that's actually going pretty well. She's uh, she's famous and she's stunning and she's interesting and she makes me laugh. She makes me bend over laughing. Um, and all the other wonderful people in my life. I may be able to. I may talk to her about revealing her name in pictures someday. Anyway, uh, that's it for the Stratosphere Lounge episode something or other. I'm going to call it episode X until I can find out how many. I think it's 15 now, something like that. Uh, thanks for joining us. We'll hope to see you next week. I'm hoping to be back uh, regular Wednesday, Wednesday schedule. It is not my low priority, but it is my lowest priority, meaning if I have a paying job or, or something else that comes up or I have to be speaking at an event, this has to come last because it's kind of for fun, but that doesn't mean it doesn't mean the world to me. Uh, thanks for your comments and your, and your feedback, as always, and uh, I'm sure I'll see you next week, and hopefully we'll have some good news. Y'all take care. Be careful out there now. Bye-bye.